Thank you. And the final item of business today is a debate, a member's business debate in the name of Annie Wells on World AIDS Day 2017. It's a debate which will be put without a question being put, will be held without a question being put. Would any member who wishes to speak in the debate press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on Annie Wells to open the debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is with great pleasure that I get to open the debate today, only three days before the 29th annual World AIDS Day bringing much needed attention to how we remember the estimated 37 million people worldwide that have lost their lives to AIDS-related illnesses, and how we in Scotland can be at the forefront of pharmaceutical care and can contribute to the global mission to eradicate new infections. Founded in 1988, World AIDS Day was the first ever Global Health Day, and it is vitally important now, as it was nearly three decades ago. By wearing the red ribbon as a symbol of solidarity with HIV positive people and those living with AIDS, it provides us an opportunity to unite in the fight against HIV by fighting prejudice and, and improving education. Ultimately, it reminds both the public and us here in this chamber that HIV has not gone away. Arguably one of the most destructive pandemics in modern history, in 2016, 36.7 million people were living with HIV and AIDS, and it resulted in 1 million deaths in that year alone. There were 300,000 fewer new HIV cases in 2016 than in 2015, which gives confidence that worldwide strategies are indeed working. Over 100,000 people are living with HIV in the UK, and over 6,000 of that total live here in Scotland. One of the most concerning statistics is that two young people in this country are diagnosed with HIV every month. We are, always a, we, are, we are all aware that currently no cure or vaccine exists. However, science has come a long way since the 1980s and the antiretroviral treatment has advanced to slow the course of the disease and can lead to a person diagnosed with the disease living to near a normal life expectancy. I am extremely proud that on the 10th of April 2017, the Scottish Medicines Consortium announced that the drug Truvada was agreed an effective treatment to prevent the transmission of HIV, thus making Scotland the first country in the Union to approve the prescription of a pre-exposure prophy prophylaxis on the NHS. We would not be able to declare such a status if it was not for the hard work of HIV Scotland who spent years campaigning for PrEP provision via the NHS as part of a comprehensive prevention strategy. In 2016, a PrEP Good Practice Guide was published by HIV Scotland as a result of collaboration of community members, service providers, researchers and decision makers all coming together to learn and work in a multi-sector partnership. Although many new treatments and strategies will be needed to finally bring an end to the AIDS pandemic, one thing is for sure, we will not be able to stop the spread of the disease without bringing treatments to all of those who need it. Hence the focus in this motion today on Scotland attempting to, ex to exceed the UN AIDS 1990 goals. 90% 90 of all people living with HIV will know their HIV status. 90% of all people with, di with diagnosed HIV infection will receive sustained antiretroviral anti therapy and 90% of all people receiving antiretroviral therapy will have viral suppression. 1990 has been set to be achieved by 2020 and by UN AIDS own admission it is an ambitious target to completely end the AIDS pandemic by 2030. Although it is ambitious it is certainly achievable if we build on the powerful momentum of this new narrative in HIV treatment. I believe that education is the most powerful resource we have in our battle to reduce the risk of HIV infection in Scotland. UNESCO places access to sexual health education of the utmost importance, and it is also, it is also its number one strategic priority. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 17, also states that children have the right to information that is vital that is of vital importance to their health and well-being, even though these international human rights organisations see sexual health education as a right of young people, 
Sexual health lessons in Scotland are still not compulsory. Such lessons are taught via RSHP. However, teaching inconsistencies can be found throughout Scotland's 32 local authorities. Only on the 22nd of October this year, I asked the Education Secretary what the Scottish Government's response was to the reported inconsistencies across Scotland's local authorities. The response that the Curriculum for Excellence provides flexibility for teachers to decide what children learn within a broad framework is one we all respect. However, we would welcome a consistent approach to RSHP education throughout local authorities. Scotland could also lead the way on significantly reducing HIV-related stigma via a reformed sexual health curriculum. Radical initiatives must be sought to reduce HIV-related stigma and to respect the human rights of populations who find themselves stigmatised in many ways already. According to Scotland's HIV anti-stigma strategy, the recent outbreak of HIV among injectable drug users in Glasgow was compounded by the multiple stigmas attached to both HIV and drug use. Stigmatisation based on gender, sexual preference, race, culture and religion, class and poverty and criminalisation can be profound and lasting for people living with and affected by HIV. It is down to us to understand how and where people are experiencing stigma to properly legislate against it and to promote successful intervention strategies. In conclusion, presiding officer, Finally, bringing an end to the AIDS pandemic is more than an enduring commitment we have to the 37 million people who lost their lives to this preventable disease. It also represents what an incredible opportunity we have to lay the foundations for a healthier, less stigmatised and more equal world for the young people of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Ruth Maguire. Apologies, presiding officer. Um, thank you. And thanks to my colleague Annie Wells for securing um, this debate and bringing such an important topic to the chamber. And can I just apologise for having the wrong ribbon on? It's from the previous debate, but I do have a red one in my office, which I'll, I'll put on later. Um, this debate's an opportunity to reflect on the estimated 35 million people who've died from AIDS-related illnesses and to reflect on how we can support and care for the over 6,000 people living with HIV in Scotland. Um, I'd like to commend HIV Scotland for the excellent work that they do in raising awareness around HIV and promoting evidence-based policy changes to support those living with or those at risk of HIV. As Annie Wells mentioned, stigma is perhaps the biggest issue facing those living with HIV in Scotland. And with many people left ostracised and with poor health and social outcomes, such as uh, mental ill health, anxiety and suicidal feelings. Stigma um, is also one of the biggest barriers to testing, treatment and support. HIV Scotland estimate that around 13% of people with HIV in Scotland are actually unaware of their HIV status, with a fear of a positive diagnosis discouraging individuals from getting tested and engaging and with health way. services. Yes. Tom Arthur. Thank you, Having way, um, I, th I think there's a very important point here being raised about stigma and the fear of testing. Uh, I just wonder if she agrees with me that, like, which is incredibly important and is affecting cultural shift where we no longer look at HIV and HIV diagnosis as a death sentence as it one was, but as it once was, but rather as a manageable condition, indeed one which people now can expect to almost live full and, and relatively healthy lives with. Ruth McGuire. Absolutely, I wholeheartedly agree with um, my colleague Tom Arthur's comments, and I think it's important to note that we've all got an HIV status. It's not something just for other people. Um, the stigma around, and fear around um, wanting uh, around testing can, of course, lead to late, an, an increase in late diagnosis, which will negatively impact on a person's quality of life and life expectancy. Concerningly, in HIV Scotland's recent report, HIV and Education: Guaranteeing Lessons for All. 
They highlighted that every month, two young people in Scotland are diagnosed as being HIV positive. I believe that was a, a matter that Annie Wells mentioned in her opening speech as well. I raised this issue in the Chamber last month and was pleased that the Minister Eileen Campbell made clear that NHS boards will continue to work with schools and local authorities to deliver change and stage appropriate RSHP education on the risks of HIV and this existing work will be built on as we move forward. And moving forward, we have to all continue to work hard to end HIV-related stigma through education in our schools and through Scotland's wider HIV anti-stigma strategy. We must continue to raise awareness around the fact that everyone has an HIV status and encourage people to get tested. We must continue to ensure that people living with HIV have access to the medical and emotional support that they need to lead fulfilling and healthy long lives. But as we work to do that, there's also quite a bit to take pride in. We can take pride that we're a global leader in HIV policy by ensuring access to new medicines and treatments to treat HIV. We can take pride in becoming the first country in the UK to offer PrEP on the NHS. We can take pride that last year's new reported cases of HIV at 317 was the lowest annual figure recorded since 2003. And we can take pride in Scotland's HIV anti-stigma strategy, Roadmap to Zero. Created by the HIV Anti-Stigma Consortium, a unique document produced in collaboration with people living with and affected by HIV, academics, the NHS and the third sector. This provides the foundations for Scotland's HIV Anti-Stigma Strategy Action Plan that will be published in 2018. I look forward to seeing that strategy and in the meantime would encourage everyone, particularly us MSPs, to use whatever influence we have to tackle HIV-related stigma wherever we see it and wherever we can. Thank you. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Colin Smith. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to be given the opportunity to talk in this debate today and help colleagues across the chamber highlight the need to end HIV-related stigma and contribute to the zero new infections target that has been ambitiously set. For many people of my age, the first real knowledge of AIDS will have come from the apocalyptic and highly controversial advert that was aired on television in 1986. For those that don't remember the advert, it's probably worth looking at it. It certainly got the message across that AIDS was potentially a lethal disease, but it was also frightened those that saw it into avoiding people with AIDS. And it took a huge amount of time to reverse this view. And it was, this was undoubtedly assisted by the work of people like Princess Diana. Unwittingly, in 1982-83, I came into contact with AIDS sufferers when I went to Africa. As a young soldier, I was sent to Uganda to work with the Uganda National Liberation Army. Before flying out, I was given a very short briefing by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which I had to say did little to prepare me. I was, however, given a much more extensive briefing by the regimental doctor, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Page. He spent a considerable amount of time teaching me basic medical skills so that I could at least help my colleagues in difficult situations. Now, my tour in Uganda was spent in the jungle, and unlike some, I couldn't claim to be a celebrity, and there was no way out. And my daily routine included holding sick parades for soldiers and their families. This was supervised by a Ugandan medical officer who at every opportunity would dust off his one syringe and one needle. The needle was then sharpened before and after the injection on the inside of a glass. Now, I have no idea what he was injecting in most cases, but he assured me it would work. My task at the sick parade, however, was to help and treat using a medical pack that had been given to, the form, by, to me by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, minor injuries. No gloves, no anaesthetic, but with plenty of improvisations. The outcomes for our patients were without doubt better than the, if we had done nothing, and probably better than if they'd experienced the trusty needle. They were also better than the outcomes that the local witch doctor achieved, but his was a bit, of a, bit, bit more of a kill or a cure message. Sadly, sometimes our lack of knowledge showed, but we did our best. Now, during my time that we were there, we saw a few cases of a disease called SLIM, and there seemed to be no positive outcomes for those who suffered this disease. It would affect husbands and wives, 
and often the youngest children, but not all the children. And those it did affect were more often than not, it affected with tragic consequences. Little did I know what we were seeing or trying to deal with was AIDS. If I had, I wonder if we would have looked on things in a different way. I suspect we might have done. I also suspect that my colleagues and I would have dealt with things in a different way if we'd seen the advert that was aired in 1986. And, presiding officer, that is the point I would like to make. We had no worries about what we were doing to a lack of knowledge. Today we have knowledge, and we know that there is more that we can do for those that have AIDS and those that live with HIV. There is no need or indeed any excuse to stigmatise them, and they are the same as you and me, and we must end all stigma relating to their conditions. On Friday, I will take a moment to remember the 35-odd million people that had died from AIDS-related illnesses and those that I might have unwittingly come into contact with. To me, they were and will always remain as fellow human beings who needed help, and that's what they should always remain and all they ever should have been. Thank you, President. Thank you. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, President Officer. Can I also thank Annie Wells for tabling her motion, which provides members with the, the opportunity to mark World AIDS Day on the 1st of December through today's debate. The UN theme for this year's World AIDS Day is My Health, My Right. And I want to use my brief comments today to highlight the right to proper health and social care for older people living with HIV. Now, it's worth pausing for a moment to think about that statement, older people living with HIV. When many of us were growing up in the 80s and 90s and witnessing the emergence of, of AIDS, the letters HIV were seen very much as a death sentence and not something you grew old with. And still today, to all our utter shame, tragically a million people a year still die from AIDS. Those deaths are unnecessary. Thanks to the, the wonders of science and the tireless campaign of charities across the world, with early diagnosis and the right treatment, those with HIV can and often do have near normal life expectancy as Tom Arthur highlighted earlier in his intervention. In fact, the median age of people living with HIV in Scotland rose from 36 in 1997 to 45 in 2015, and the proportion of people aged 50 or over increased from 1 in 8 in 2003 to 1 in 4 in 2014. But of course, this brings with it the challenges of ensuring that older people living with HIV have the health and social care they need. Levels of poverty amongst people living with HIV aged 55 and over are double those seen in the general population and are significantly more likely to have other health problems. In fact, two-thirds of people over 50 with HIV receive treatment for other long-term conditions, again a rate almost double that of the general population. Mental health problems and depression are also more common amongst older people living with HIV than the population as a whole. So tackling these inequalities requires a meaningful action and a multi-agency approach within health and also, crucially, social care. But we know that across Scotland, social care services are under pressure. A report by HIV Scotland called Making the Vision a Reality highlighted concerns in some local authorities that funding and budget constraints, and I quote, may result in fewer people with support needs being able to receive support. In the report, one local authority stated, and again I quote, Due to current budget constraints, not all people with HIV may meet the critical eligibility criteria we can currently fund, therefore may not be able to access social work funded services. So we need to properly resource social care and we also have to ensure that staff are equipped with a strong understanding of HIV because, as HIV Scotland's report also highlighted, and again I quote, there is a lack of specialist training for social care staff in relation to HIV and supporting people with this. The care must also be dignified. Well, there's no doubt that most care is of a high standard. A report by National AIDS Trust H called HIV A Guide for Care Providers highlighted experiences some people with HIV had in care homes and the discriminatory treatment they received. One resident with HIV was made to have the last bath of the day and was given separate cutlery. Another described difficulty getting a staff member to assist them in the shower. Several highlighted breaches in confidentiality, and in one instance, a care assistant advised a resident's visitors not to let their children see him because of his HIV. Ruth McGuire, Annie Wells, and Edward Moulton all commented on the stigma surrounding HIV, and in particular, Scotland's anti-stigma strategy, Roadmap to Zero. 
That stigma can not only be isolating and distressing, it can also act as a barrier to receiving the care and support people with HIV need. Presiding officer, in concluding, there remains a great deal more to be done to improve the provision and standard of social care for those living with HIV. The integration of health and social care will fundamentally change how care is delivered, and it is an opportunity to address some of these challenges. Taking a more collaborative approach to delivering care for those with HIV is in itself a step in the right direction, but we must ensure that we expand expertise and knowledge of HIV by those delivering that care. Equally, structural changes through integration must be backed up with the funding needed to deliver services. Social care is an increasingly critical aspect of care for those with HIV, in particular older people living with HIV. That may be a good challenge to have and certainly not one we faced 30 years ago, but it's also a growing challenge and we all have a duty to make sure our health and social care services fully meet that challenge. Thank you. Thank you. I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to take part in this debate, and I'm grateful that the motion has been brought to the, the Chamber. Like a, a couple of other members, I was going to reflect a little on how things have changed over the years. Uh, I was uh, growing up when those uh, TV uh, advertising campaigns that Edward Mountain referred to were being shown. Uh, I hadn't come out at that point. I hadn't uh, let's be honest, started my sex life uh, at that point. Uh, and that, that kind of set of ideas around fear, around, uh, you know, uh, certain aspects of that campaign may have been well-meaning, but certain aspects also, I'm sure, exacerbated uh, the fear and the stigma that arises uh, as a result of, of fear. Uh, and I was certainly very aware of that. A little later, as a, as a student, uh, as something that I, I had caused to uh, reflect on in, a, in an earlier debate this year. Uh, I was a student in Manchester at the time that God's Cop uh, was raiding uh, gay clubs uh, in Manchester, sending police in uh, wearing biohazard gear. Uh, and again, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, ignorant uh, and prejudiced attitudes that informed that behavior. Sadly, uh, I was reminded of that when Colin Smith uh, was mentioning some of those practices a moment ago uh, in care homes, again grounded in needless uh, and ignorant attitudes towards HIV and the stigma that arises from that, that ignorance. Uh, I then, a few years later, had uh, a few years working uh, in an HIV agency in Glasgow uh, and thinking about what has changed since those days, very clearly immense scientific and medical progress has been made. And as others have mentioned, in particular, treatment uh, is dramatically more effective. Many, many, many people living long and healthy lives, at least here in wealthy countries, that's the case. It's not the case everywhere. But there's also immense progress being made on testing. I, I recently, uh, in the run-up to, to World AIDS Day, dropped into uh, the uh, THT offices in Glasgow. Uh, the, the agency I used to work for, FACE, uh, West, then Face Scotland, eventually merged and became uh, THT Scotland after I'd uh, left. Uh, and so I was able to catch up with a few old colleagues there uh, and uh, took a test, which was just a, a tiny little finger prick, and it took seconds, literally seconds, for the result to be clear. Again, that cheap, convenient, and easy form of testing, which wasn't available when I was working uh, in the field. And as others have mentioned as well, not only treatment, not only testing, but prevention. We have new tools in the box when it comes to prevention with the availability uh, of PrEP in Scotland. And I very much welcome the progress that's been made there. There are some things that I hope have changed, that I don't know have changed, but I, I hope. Uh, one of the, the last things that I, uh, I was involved in challenging when I was uh, working for uh, FACE at the time uh, was the promotion of anti-condom messages uh, being pushed in schools by an organization promoting uh, the Billings ovulation method of birth control, basically one step up from the rhythm method, a complete nonsense to be pushing in schools, uh, but uh, you know, whether uh, motivated by their, their religious ethos or, or anything else, they were also pushing uh, the kind of disinformation uh, that's been pushed in some developing countries, uh, telling young people that their condoms have holes in them that will let HIV through. 
essentially telling people not to use condoms as a means of protecting themselves against HIV transmission. I really hope that there is no such uh, information being peddled or misinformation being peddled in our schools today. But there are still those who argue against the comprehensive equality-based sex education uh, that all young people should have access to. And the, the government must show determination to ensure that that's a reality. And of course, there are some things that haven't changed. Uh, the stigma, the prejudice, and the misunderstanding uh, still persist, and we all need to take a responsibility to challenge that. And it was partly as a result of that ongoing stigma, there are aspects of the law that haven't changed. The criminalization of sex work, uh, of drug use, uh, and even of transmission, uh, which uh, directly harms people's lives. And the economic injustices uh, in drug access globally uh, haven't changed enough. It would be wrong to say there's been no change, wrong to say that there's no progress, but when we look at the the target that's been talked about uh, for uh, access to treatment, uh, the, the target for 90% of people living with HIV to know their status, 90% of people with diagnosed infection to receive sustained antiretroviral, antiretroviral therapy, and 90% of all people receiving that therapy to have viral suppression. That 90-90-90 target, uh, we're still a long way off achieving that globally. Uh, I'm told we're at 70, 77, 82. So in each one of those three, progress has been made with the availability or the greater availability of generic drugs, but not nearly enough progress. And some things finally that have changed for the worst, presiding officer. Uh, Colin Smith mentioned the economic insecurity that a great many people live with, whether that's in relation to social security, whether it's in relation uh, to insecure work, or whether it's in relation to the impact uh, that austerity has had on the public services uh, that people living with HIV need to have access to, uh, or the inhumanity of our immigration and asylum system. These things have changed for the worse. Uh, and as one example, just in closing, presiding officer, uh, the loss of a needle exchange service in Glasgow, for example, is almost inevitably going to lead to an increase in infections. And I would agree uh, with those, including Alison Thulis from the SNP, who's quoted today saying that evidence from safe injecting facilities in other countries demonstrates they reduce levels of drug addiction uh, as well as improving public safety through the re reducing the level of discarded needles and other related items. Uh, I hope that the Scottish Government agrees with that comment from Alison Thulis and will be committed to ensuring safe injecting facilities everywhere that they are needed and I would say that the stigma that exists in relation to HIV harms individual lives, but it also harms our collective ability to make political progress on those controversial and difficult subjects, uh, whether in relation to drug use, sex work, or any of the other areas where we haven't seen uh, movement in the right direction. Thank you once again for the chance to take part. And I call on Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, um, for letting me say a few words this evening and also to my colleague Annie Wells for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. Um, I'd also like to welcome to the gallery um, members of the um, consortium who uh, HIV Scotland brought together to work on the strategy which will be launched this week, which is the Roadmap to Zero, which is about ending stigma for people um, living and affected by AIDS. Um, it's been a, a really wonderful debate to listen to this evening. And, and we've talked about um, AIDS and the challenges in, in different communities around the world and the reason for AIDS being, being there in different communities and um, recognizing that it is a de disease that is universal to us and that um, so much progress has been made in um, identifying, in treatment, in testing uh, in all these areas um, we have certainly come a long long way from when I first knew about it um, a, a, as a young teenager much like uh, Patrick Harvey. Um, I want to talk about how thankful I am about the content of the Roadmap to Zero. It is about stigma in HIV but it, it, it's really a document that teaches about stigma in any areas about some of the you know anti-gay um, feelings, anti-religious um, uh, feelings, anti um, all, all the feelings that can come in to stigmatizing people about certain areas. Um, it really challenges those attitudes and it challenges 
um, our, our, our belief systems about what we do. And I think that's such a powerful document. And I really thank the consortium for building it in that, e that area. Um, the five areas that asks us to challenge ourselves is, is as individuals with our own feelings and knowledge, um, challenging our to, to become, us all to become educate, educated about areas um, where there might be stigma. Our interpersonal relationships, challenging family and friends and partners in some of their attitudes, organisationally in our workplaces, in our social institutions, anywhere that we see that stigma being applied to people um, living with AIDS, you know, we can, we can challenge it in our communities. And also um, our community and cultural values. And I, I said each community will have its own experience of AIDS. For some, it, it will be um, a sexual health issue. For others, it will be, have been from uh, drugs issues. And yeah, we have to recognise those and understand those before we can truly tackle um, uh, uh, reduce infections, but also reduce that stigma to zero. And of course, our structural, our national laws and our public policy have to reflect that that anti-stigma message has to be at the heart of what we're doing. So I just want to finish by mentioning what the partners have all committed to do, which are the five things which I think are, are so important. They want to end HIV-related stigma in Scotland. They want to participate fully in designing, implementing and monitoring programmes to reduce stigma. They want to work collaboratively with other partners to introduce necessary policy changes. They want to strengthen meaningful involvement of people living with and affected by HIV. And they want to hold each other accountable for progress towards zero stigma goals. And I think um, those five asks are so powerful so important and um, I wish um, the consortium all the best moving forward and also should mention the funding from MacAIDS that made, made all this report possible. It's a very powerful document and something that I think we should all be reading and taking on board in our, our jobs as politicians. Thank you. Can I thank, thank you. Uh, and can I ask the Minister Eileen Campbell to uh, respond to the debate on behalf of the government? Thank you, President Officer, and, I, and like others, I would also like to thank uh, Annie Wells for securing this debate and all those members who took part for their uh, speeches. This is a welcome opportunity to consider how far we have come in tackling HIV ahead of World AIDS Day on Friday. World AIDS Day, as others have noted, provides an opportunity to show our support for the millions of people living with HIV worldwide and to remember those who have died over the last years since the virus emerged. Over the last 30 years or so, huge scientific advances have been made in relation to the treatment of HIV. But while we have come a long way, new HIV infections are still being diagnosed in Scotland every week. Despite all the progress we've made, some of those still at risk still don't know how to protect themselves. And some too many hold outdated views about the facts of HIV, leading to that needless stigmatization that many have talked about this evening. So we must make sure that we continue to raise uh, awareness. The theme of World AIDS Day this year is let's end it and we must work together to end isolation, to end stigma and to end HIV transmission. Sadly however stigma remains a problem for many people living with HIV and for some people that means that they live in fear of their HIV status being revealed to those they live, work and spend time with. It's vital therefore that we take an evidence-based approach to addressing stigma we need to take account what has worked in the past and what hasn't here or elsewhere in the world. And I believe a significant part of tackling stigma is providing everyone with the facts about HIV. Government, third sector organisations, practitioners and infected, those infected with HIV need to continue to collaborate in our efforts to tackle this problem. And Annie Wells in her uh, remarks mentioned the importance of uh, education and raised uh, the issue around uh, consistency of RSHP. And again, you know, I would reiterate the words of uh, Ruth Maguire and the, uh, in the uh, interest that Ruth Maguire continues to take because we are making sure that we develop, develop that consistency that I think Annie Wells was asking of us. NHS boards are working with local authorities and other partners to support the delivery of high quality, consistent and inclusive RSHP education in schools across Scotland. 
Boards are also currently working with authorities to produce a national RSHP resource to support effective uh, teaching. That new resource will cover a range of issues, including consent, healthy relationships, and the impact of digital technology, and all, will also be fully inclusive of LGBTI uh, issues, all based on facts and certainly not on myths. I think Patrick Harvey uh, is right to uh, articulate that we need to guard uh, against. Also important, though, is ensuring that there's good quality quality education available to professionals. For example, I'm glad that the Scottish Government has supported successful training initiatives such as the Caring Conversation training resource developed by Waverley Care. The resource encourages NHS staff to think about how they interact with patients promoting honest and caring conversations. It focuses on HIV and uses case studies from HIV patients themselves, but the learning is also relevant to people working with patients living with any long-term condition. And again, to reiterate the point that I think uh, Colin Smith was making, we need to recognise and the opportunity we have through integration to ensure that that type of uh, support is also available to those in caring roles, to make sure that we uh, empower them, to enable them to have those, um, that education and to help enhance their ability to deliver uh, care. It's also important to sort fact from fiction when it comes to HIV, and it's important that we can empathise with those affected. It's also vital that we hear directly what it's like for people living with HIV, and I would like to thank every person in Scotland living with HIV who has spoken about their experiences, whether to one friend over a cup of tea or on stage in front of hundreds. All of that work is uh, valued and appreciative and helps on our journey towards tackling that stigma and enhancing the education offer and uh, across the country. HIV prevention remains though uh, key to our uh, sexual health and bloodborne virus framework. With the highly effective treatments now in place and with pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP now available on the NHS in Scotland, we're already having some of the tools we need to reduce new infections within Scotland to zero. A significant challenge, however, is to get to the people who are infected but undiagnosed to ensure that they are tested and that they are treated. Our framework is clear that normalising and expanding testing is key and we're working with NHS colleagues to do this. It's also important to remember, though, that some of those affected most by HIV are also marginalised in other ways, such as those who inject drugs. And when a person has a serious addiction, they may not be able to take the steps to protect themselves for infection. And that's why we need to ensure that support is in place to address the underlying addiction and to reduce the harm that that addiction poses. Uh, yes, although I was going to come to the issues around needle exchange later on, but if that's... Is, is that okay? <laughs> although challenges remain, it is encouraging to see the significant decline in new infections in 2016 uh, in Scotland. And like Ruth Maguire, I take pride that Scotland was the first part of the UK to make uh, PrEP available to eligible patients. And again, we'd pay tribute to the third sector, HIV Scotland, we've really cared and a whole host for setting the tone and allowing that to be viewed as an appropriate public health intervention uh, to prevent illness. Based on evidence, it was a, a good, uh, I think, a good response and a good reaction, and it was the work that they did to help uh, enable that uh, discussion to take place. And I know that for many people in Scotland, PrEP is making a huge difference to their lives. Uh, the medical uh, advances in stark contrast, I think, to the way people uh, that Edward Mounted described coped with uh, as best they could when, during his time uh, in Africa. Though to go on to the issue around the needle exchanges uh, as well, I wanted to make sure that I had an opportunity to talk about that. Patrick Harvey is absolutely right to raise the issue of needle exchange because that situation has and does pose a significant uh, public health risk. And I just want to assure him that work is still ongoing with Network Rail and others, uh, uh, including Hamza Yusuf, to achieve a, a satisfactory solution. Again, we'll reiterate that I'll keep him updated as that work can, uh, progresses. OK. Patrick Harvey. I'm, uh, I'm grateful for the Minister in, in addressing that, and I, I do look forward to hearing uh, progress on that. And I appreciate that there are difficulties when there's a third organisation like Network Rail involved. But can I ask, is the government committed to the principle uh, of ensuring not only needle exchange, but also, as uh, the Minister's colleague Alison Thoulis has acknowledged, the potential for safe injecting facilities as well, which could make a huge amount of difference, and the evidence for this around the world is extremely strong? Minister. Um, I was going to come on to that point as well, but certainly in terms of the needle exchange, you know, again, you know, like PrEP and like the whole approach we want to take through public health, if it's based on evidence, then we need to make sure that these things are enabled. And that, I think, the, the situation with uh, Network Rail maybe shows that interface with uh, those that 
don't, that's not normally their world and how we need to enable these discussions to be far more open uh, and to uh, ensure that progress can be made. Um, again, though, I will keep him updated on the issue around the needle exchange, but again, on the, the safe injection uh, rooms, Outlined, I outlined our refreshed approach to the drug strategy earlier on this afternoon, uh, that we would continue to work with uh, Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership on that, because um, Patrick Harvey made, is right to make the case that the, case ha the public health case has uh, been made and continues to be made. The Lord Advocate has provided his advice, and that is welcome, but it's clear that we don't, at the moment, have the legislative powers, and that's why I've written to the UK government to meet, to discuss the scope to get those powers uh, to Scotland to help us move this uh, issue forward. And on that issue, again, we'll continue to keep him engaged because that shouldn't be the last word on this matter uh, because of the uh, public health concerns that he is right to outline. So, in conclusion, Pre Presiding Officer, I'm clear that those affected by HIV in Scotland should have the same level of protection from discrimination and prejudice as everyone else. In line with the World AIDS Day theme, our sexual health and bloodborne virus framework has redu reductions in stigma as one of its five high-level outcomes. And we want to live in communities that have positive, non-stigmatising and supportive attitudes towards people affected by HIV. World AIDS Day help us, helps us communicate that aspiration. To, so too do debates like this in our parliament. On Friday, though, I hope that we can all take the opportunity to remember the impact HIV has had on lives in Scotland and globally, to reflect on the progress made in treating the infection and consider what we can do to reduce new infections even further and better support those living with HIV. I suppose we should also reflect that this time last year when we had this debate, PrEP wasn't uh, available. That was the call. So it shows you how fast things can progress uh, in this if we are, work together, collaborate and put our minds to making the improvements that we all seek. So uh, again, thank you to Annie Wells and to the others who have contributed and uh, look forward to continuing that work with them um, as we make the improvements that we want to see for those with HIV in Scotland. Can I thank the Minister and the members for their contributions and that concludes our debate. I now close this meeting.